two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the October 17th, 2022 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's Policy Review Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams Live on the BCPS website. To conduct this meeting by virtual means, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Wash, Ms. Pitts, or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Pitts, please call, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Good afternoon. Ms. Causey? Present. Dr. Hager? Present. Thank you. Ms. Hen? Present. Ms. Hassan? Ms. Rowe? Present. We have a quorum, Ms. Rowe. Thank you, Ms. Pitts. Please call the roll to determine the presence of staff members who are present. Jim Corns. Pete Dixit. Present. Thank you. Patrick Fannin. Present. Thank you. Christopher Hartlove. Present. Thank you. Margaret Ann Howie. Here. Thank you. Meryl Plate. Present. Thank you. And Vicki Wash. Here. Thank you. All have been accounted for. Okay, thank you. The first item on the agenda is policy 7330 capital projects funded by private donation. And Mr. Dixit, please proceed. So good evening, Chair Rowe and members of the board. We are here tonight for policy 7330. As you'll recall, the policy was presented in the last meeting and approved. Uh, however, in an attempt to find clarification for a question raised by Dr. Hager, we find the response did not answer the question and it needed clarification. So we apologize for the confusion and would like to present the changes one more time and then ask for your approval so that we present all the changes as have been made to the policy. Sure, go ahead, Mr. Dixit. So the policy before the committee uh, has been revised as follows. In subparagraph 1A, line 12, it aligns the policy statement with the board's goal of preparing student for future. The new subparagraph 1B, that includes the authority of the board to approve or reject private, do private donations for capital improvement projects, whether partially or fully funded by a third party donation. Subparagraph 2A includes the requirement that all proposals submitted under this policy must align with board goals and comply with board policies, superintendent's rule, and school system procedures. Subparagraph 2D requires the superintendent to establish guidelines for project submission requirements, criteria for determining the appropriateness of the project and for the approval of the project. And then Fifth is we are just conforming with the policy review committee's editing conventions. So these, those were the changes that were made and the changes are shown in the policy that has been presented to you for approval. Committee members, are there any questions? Hearing none. Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Kazi. Thank you. I was uh, typing in the chat that I had a question. Um, so 
this policy 7330. Um, I see in the policy analysis um, what has gone on to date, but uh, could you clarify, Mr. Dixit, what was the question and what was the answer that wasn't clear? So some of the 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 item that we presented were the changes that were discussed in the board meeting, but they are not part of the policy. So inadvertently, I shared with you some of the changes as uh, that were discussed in the board meetings as as the changes in the policy and for which I apologize that was confusion on my part. So what it looks like is that uh, the language was not included that says uh, including specific donor information, donor type, whether unit of government, nonprofit organization, business, community group, PTA, individuals, et cetera, type of donation, funds, donations in kind, donations of service, et cetera. So Ms. Causey, as you see from what's footnoted, that language was actually defeated in the board meeting, but in order to make sure that uh, your record is complete, that was placed in the analysis, just so the board has a record of exactly what's gone on with the history of the policy, but the motion failed. At which meeting? The footnote that says February, 22nd, 2022? Yes, ma'am. Was that the full board or the committee meeting? Full board, ma'am. Okay. Uh, well, I would like to suggest to this committee that we recommend uh, that it go to the full board from the committee because there have been projects where there has been some confusion and the language in the policy itself uh, partially or fully funded by private donations um, is really not clear when we have a number of donations that are made by government. So Ms. Howie, can you advise, since we don't have our parliamentarian here, if it's appropriate for us to send something to the full board that's already specifically been defeated by the full board? It's still up to this committee. I mean, the, the policy, the full policy was recommitted. So the, the committee is able to discuss whether or not the committee wishes to accept or reject the recommendation or the lack of recommendation from the full board. But uh, just as a matter of clarification, I do not believe that if a project is county funded, that is deemed a private donation. Okay, so, um, Ms. Kazi, what is the motion that you're proposing? I move to amend policy 7370 on page one, line 37, to include including specific donor information, donor type, whether unit of government, nonprofit organization, business, community group, PTA, individuals, et cetera, type of donation, funds, donations in kind, donations of service, et cetera. Is there a second? Would Mrs. Causey please repeat her motion? Or put it in the chat? Yeah, please write it in the chat. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. It, it's in the policy analysis on page two, if that helps line 14. Um, so I'll repeat it and, and then I'll type it. I move to amend policy 7370 to include on page one, line 37, including specific donor information, donor type, whether unit of government, nonprofit organization, business, community group, PTA, individuals, etc., 
type of donation, funds, donations in kind, donations of service, etc. I'm going to pull that language up. Is there a second to the motion? Um, I'll second it. This is Aaron Hager. OK, is there any discussion or question on the motion? Madam Chair, if I could speak to my motion. Go ahead. There have been uh, projects that have come forward to the board um, where it is not clear uh, from where the funding comes, especially when there are multiple donors involved in one project. And I think it's important for the board to understand for transparency um, for those projects. Um, Dr. Hager, could you say what you put in the chat? Yeah, I, I uh, seconded the motion in part because I didn't quite understand if the board uh, made those changes at our board meeting, why they were not included in the policy when it so came Dr. back to the PRC. Dr. Hager, the board did not make those changes. The motion failed for lack of a second, therefore did not go forward at the board meeting in February of 2022. That's why that language is not incorporated because the board as a body did not accept these proposed amendments. Thank you. And then, so why did it come back to PRC then? It was recommitted to PRC uh, simply to discuss again. It was not recommitted to PRC with specific uh, direction. But again, in order to make sure that the record is clear, we believe that more information is better than less. Got so it. This, and, yeah. And and the um. So the the version we're seeing now is exactly the same as the one that was presented to the board in February. That is correct. Sorry for not following that line. Okay, thank you. No problem. You're welcome. Are there any other comments on the motion? Madam Chair, I would just say I believe there was not a second due to time in that meeting <clears throat> that there was not discussion. And then, okay. so I would ask for support for this. Thank you. So, Ms. Pitts, could you please call a roll? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. H I'm sorry. Ms. Rowe? Yes. We have four in favor. Okay, the motion carries. Uh, Ms. Hen, you had questions about the policy? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, under D2, according to the policy as drafted, if the superintendent determines that the proposal does not meet the criteria determined for appropriateness of the project, will the project still come to the board for consideration? And do we need clarification added um, if, the, if it's determined that it does not meet the criteria? So I'm sure Mr. Dixie can fill in more uh, completely, but uh, my recollection is that when a proposal is defeated or rejected uh, prior to the superintendent level, prior to the board level, they don't come to the board. Uh, they're simply rejected for whatever reason. There are approximately, and again, Mr. Dixie, you can correct me on this, there are approximately 10 offices that I believe that are involved in the review. So it could be a risk management issue. It could be a budgetary issue. It could be uh, that, uh, again, any of the offices that are involved uh, could have rejected it for any of the reasons uh, that um, have nothing to do with uh, anything the board would have to approve or act on. Thank you, Ms. Howie. And the reason I ask is because in D3, um, it, the language is specific to the administrative approval process um, in order to receive board consideration. So that is specific. And I've seen that checklist um, and you're correct. It goes through multiple um, departments that and sign off receives those sign offs. So my question has to do with if we are specific that it requires all of those sign offs in order to receive board consideration, but we don't state that it also needs to meet 
um, the criteria to determine the appropriateness, is that also a check or a box that needs to be checked before coming to the board for consideration? Or when the board receives it for consideration, does it come with or without a superintendent's recommendation um, similar to the board receiving um, other voting items? So whenever these come before the board, they have already received all of the appropriate administrative approval. We would not send it to the board, send these projects to the board had they not been approved at the administrative level. And due to the fact that the, the appropriateness could be subjective, um, I believe we need clarification here and I would support that these come to the to the board um, for consideration with or without a recommendation of the superintendent and would support language being added to that effect. I don't have specific language to specify that, but I'm open to recommendations from committee members um, or staff to that effect if anyone has any suggestions and would be interested Senator, in what the committee thinks. Senator, are you suggesting that all applications should come to the board for approval with a recommendation from the superintendent staff? I believe there's two um, points here under D. One is that it has to complete the administrative approval process under D3. Um, the second is the appropriateness of the project, which is more subjective. So I believe that those that complete the administrative approval process um, should come to the board that have already received the sign off. However, because the appropriateness may be subjective, I believe those should come to the board and that if the superintendent has any concerns that um, he would make those concerns known to the board when they come to the board, but that the board should make that determination again considering the superintendent's recommendation or lack thereof. Committee members, does anyone object to adjusting the policy language to achieve that goal? No, no objection. So respectfully, members of the committee, I'm not sure what problem we're trying to solve. Um, this charges your superintendent with creating guidelines about determining the appropriateness of a project and I'm not sure exactly what you want to do. Have the board established the appropriateness? Is that the design? Can I speak to that, Madam yeah, Chair? Go ahead, Ms. Han. Thank you. Because we are not defining appropriateness and because um, that is sub a subjective measure and regardless of who defines it, um, it's comparable to other um, subjective decisions that are made by the superintendent in that those come to the board with or without a recommendation and the board as a governing body in its collective judgment makes those decisions and discusses and deliberates on those decisions as a body. So my my goal here is to put that decision, that ultimate decision, again, taking the superintendent's recommendation um, as paramount in that process, but bringing those proposals forward and considering the superintendent's recommendation, um, bringing those to the board so that any are not um, automatically um, disregarded because of a, uh, the subjective decision of, of one individual. That is the goal. And Ms. Rowe summarized it perfectly. And I understand that the board's desire is the board's desire and obviously this committee's desire. However, um, in terms of subjectivity, I'm not sure that that uh, adequately encompasses what the committee's concerns are. So for example, if there's a risk management um, issue uh, that has perhaps been reviewed by our insurance company, and if our insurance company indicates or insurance provider indicates that they won't ensure a particular project, that's not subjective. Uh, and that could be a reason for a denial. If, again, if the board still wants to review, notwithstanding the, re the administrative review um, of, the, of the staff, that is certainly up to the board. Thank you for that clarification, Ms. Howie. And risk management would 
I would expect would be a sign off during the administrative approval process. I, I've, as I mentioned, I've seen that check, that checklist, and that would be my expectation that that would be one of the sign offs during that process versus an appropriateness measure, which is um, much harder to um, be be you know it's either approved or not by um, that's much more an objective measure. But I'll let Dr. Hager go ahead with her question. Um, back to you, Ms. Rowe. All right, go ahead, Dr. Hager. Uh, so the the concern is that uh, the superintendent will create guidelines and, and it's a, that the board wants to see the guidelines and, and approve those. Is, is that correct? So I think the issue is once it's gone through the administrative review and has passed that part, then Ms. Hen would like it to come to the board whether it's approved or not. And if the staff recommendation is that it not be approved, but it's passed the administrative guideline and they have some a subjective appropriateness reason for not approving it, that the board hear that and that the board vote on the appropriateness of any um, acceptance of private funds for capital projects. So is that my understanding like correct, Ms. Hen? It is. It's to confirm um, the superintendent's decision or to make another um, make another decision. Normally, the board does uphold. It's it's been the case where we normally uphold the superintendent's recommendation, but it's to hear um, the concerns and to do our due diligence when there is a proposal put forth. If that proposal goes through the entire administrative review and all of those boxes are checked, um, but yet fails to meet the appropriateness determination for whatever reason, um, the board would then consider the superintendent's reason for rejecting that proposal. And upon consideration, then the board as a collective would make that decision. So, so is it? I'm sorry, so, so, um, so the, Dr. Dr. Hager, this this may assist in the discussion. I think we're talking about two different things. That if a project proposal itself is not appropriate, it's not going to go through the approval process. Based on the guidelines established by the superintendent, notwithstanding whether or not it receives, it goes through the approval process. So I think we're talking about two different processes. Uh, when we're talking about the review of the proposals. So Ms. Holly, could you answer a question for me? Um, if we have someone and they submit a request for a capital project funded by private donation and that request is denied, does the body that has requested it and it's been denied have the ability to appeal that decision to the Board of Education? I'll give you my standard answer. It depends. So 4205C4, the education article says a superintendent shall decide controversy and controversies and disputes based on the rules and regulations of the county board and the proper administration thereof. If it's considered to be part of the proper administration of the rules and regulations of the county board, then yes, it is possible that uh, an individual party could seek a review through the 4205C process. So maybe what would satisfy Ms. Hen's criteria is, you know, what we're looking for is a little bit of oversight over projects mm -hmm. that are denied. What if we put in the policy that if a capital project funded by private donation is denied approval, that the party requesting approval can appeal to the board? That would satisfy my need, Ms. Rowe. Thank you. So by giving them the appeal rights, if you know, because that way the board's not wasting time hearing mm -hmm. every single denial. If someone really has a problem with the denial, that giving them the right to appeal it to the board seems a fair thing to me. And I see a comment. Dr. Hager, I do apologize. For Go ahead, Dr. Hager. Hager. I know that's exactly where I was headed. <laughs> <laughs> Should we just put a, a way to appeal, the, a, a means for appealing if something is denied? Okay, so is there a motion to add language allowing a party to appeal a decision before the Board of Education in this policy? So moved. Is there a second? Second, Causey. Ms. Pitts, would you please call the roll? 
Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Dr. Hager. Yes. Ms. Hen. Yes. Ms. Hassan. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Thank you. We have five in favor. Are there any other amendments to this policy? We are past time, so. All right, hearing none. Ms. Is Rowe, there any? Is, I'm sorry, Ms. Rowe. This is Ms. Causey. Go ahead. Um, uh, I would like to. Um, okay, I move to amend policy 7330 on page two at line four by including the following language for period satisfactory completion of the project with timely notification going to the board. Is there a second? Okay, the motion fails for lack of second. Is there any objection to policy 7330 capital project funded by private donation proceeding to the full board as amended for approval? Madam Chair, I just had one question where um, the in related policies, it's either related policies or um, back on page one, line 34, the superintendent shall establish guidelines that include but are not limited to. Um, I think it would be helpful to uh, future boards and also to stakeholders to, to uh, clarify that that's going to be in rule 73, superintendent's rule 7330. Are you asking that we write in the policy that something not covered by the policy is going to be in the rule? I'm not sure we need to articulate that. That's sort of a given. OK, well, uh, in the public works recommendations, they suggested that in the policy that there be hot links to uh, uh, other locations that relate to that policy. So whether it's the other board policies that relate, but I think it's also um, helpful to to clarify that it is that those guidelines are housed in superintendent's rule 7330. Ms. Howie, do we already link to the appropriate rules at the bottom of every policy? We are slowly uh, trying to do that with policies, ma'am, uh, to indicate implementing rule. Okay, so that's already resolved then. So um, Ms. Hen was muted. The motion that Ms. Causey made was I move to amend policy 7330 on page two at line four by including the following language. Satisfactory completion of the project with timely notification going to the board. And Ms. Hen seconded it, but she was on mute. Ms. Hen, can you second that now? Sure, sorry about that. Second. Okay, Ms. Causey, would you like to speak to that motion? Certainly. Uh, there have been a number of instances where uh, there were projects that were approved by the board and they had um, factors where they were not completed in a timely um, manner as uh, would have been hoped, let's put it that way. So um, I think it's important that number one, it's understood that the superintendent will be establishing those guidelines for the satisfactory completion of the project and then closing uh, the loop with a report going to the board. So Ms. Causey, by report to the board, do you mean that it shows up in our information items on our agenda or do you mean that um, board agenda time is taken up with an actual report? No, no board agenda time. Just so it's the information. information. OK. Yes, um, is there any more discussion on this motion? Ms. Pitts, will you call the roll, please? Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. The Five motion carries. Thank you. Um, are there any other amendments to policy 7330? Hearing none, is there any objection? to moving policy 7330 capital projects funded by private donation to the full board for approval with a recommendation from the committee. 
Hearing no objections, policy 7330 is moved forward to the full board. Policy 8364, financial disclosure statements. Ms. Howie, please proceed. Thank you. And may Mr. Dixit and Mr. Plate please be excused? Yes. Thank you. And um, members of the committee, I do see a phone number listed. Just for our records, we want to make sure we know whose phone that is. This is Howie. I believe that's mine. This is Ms. Hassan. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. Um, members of the committee, uh, policy 8364 is before you. It's being returned um, with an amendment that was recommended at your September 19th. 2022 meeting as well there was a recommendation from staff based on a public works recommendation and finally there was a question from Ms. Hen at the last meeting about uh, expanding or contracting the titles that are included in 8364. Just very briefly 8364 is your policy on financial disclosures. It lists those individuals who are required to file a financial disclosure statement with your ethics review panel. You are required by state law and state regulation under the public ethics laws to have an ethics code policy that is at least equivalent to the ethics code laws. What the uh, State Ethics Commission also requires is that once the board approves ethics code policies, that those policies then go to the State Ethics Commission for a final blessing. Uh, so just again to review briefly what has been presented to you prior to this evening's meeting, uh, on page one, line 20 we are proposing based on the public works recommendation to have a deputy superintendent that that person be added that position rather be added to the individuals required to file as a related issue ms hen did ask whether or not there was some way to contract or expand this list um, i do not believe there is an easier way to contract the list based on my review of the state regulation which requires uh, local boards of education to have uh, in their policies those individuals they are called school officials who are required school officials or school employees who are required to file and then finally there was a discussion at last month's meeting uh, about uh, the superintendent's responsibility and your desire that the superintendent publish a list of vendors so that you as individuals required to file your financial disclosure statements would have a list of those vendors uh, who do business with the school system. So I direct your attention to page eight, starting at line 26. And the language reads on or before January 15th of each year, the superintendent shall provide access to a list of entities that did business with BCPS during the preceding calendar year. The superintendent will maintain a list of those entities for the applicable filing period for a period of seven calendar years. Um, Madam Chair, I'm available to answer uh, any questions, well, hopefully any questions that the committee would have. Thank you, Ms. Howie. Uh, Ms. Han, you had a question? I did, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Ms. Howie, for that recap of the changes. I appreciate it, that was very helpful. Um, at the bottom of page one under B item 22, yes. um, it lists any other employees so designated by the board as periodic review would suggest, which is helpful as it um, encompasses the need, which I was trying to convey at our last meeting to maintain this list um, with regards to currency and um, to maintain the policy to include any additional titles as titles change or employees that would um, need to file financial disclosure statements. I'm wondering if the committee might feel it necessary to include the superintendent um, as that position has the responsibilities of hiring and making those personnel changes and would be in the best position to know which positions may require the filing of financial disclosure statements. So, so to include language such as designated by the board 
um, as peri periodic review by the superintendent would suggest. So I would make the motion to amend line 37 on page one to insert after periodic review by the superintendent. Is there a second? second? Ms. Causey. Second, Ms. Is, Causey. Um, is there any discussion on the amendment? Dr. Hager? Um, I'm just concerned that the word periodic is pretty um, vague. Um, but I also, I don't, I'm not I'm not overly concerned about adding this language, but I, if we were to add something like this, I feel like it should be more specific. I wonder from Ms. Howie if somehow, rather than the superintendent, it should be the ethics panel that has come to say about this. So I was actually looking at the um, the regulation. And the regulation, which is Comar 19A050205, um, the regulations, which would be your board policy, shall require school officials and school employees um, to file financial disclosures. And as well, under um, 5817 of the general provisions article, that um, the regulations that are adopted, which would be your policy, shall apply to those officials designated by the school board. Okay, so the school board does that. So maybe, so how would this work? The Board of Education, do we receive a periodic update on the organizational chart from the superintendent? You, re you receive something when um, you have to approve it under um, board policy 21 something. Uh, you have to approve it uh, at the level of executive director or above. So you actually approve when there are changes at that level. So what would be the thing that would trigger a board approval of adding more people to the list of this policy only every time the policy is up for review? Uh, if there is, it seems to me that absent a review of uh, the policy about the specific titles that um, either the ethics panel can indicate to the board that they believe that there is a position that should be subject to the financial disclosure requirement. Uh, it seems to me it could come at you from different levels. It could be that the board um, believes that a particular uh, position based on um, what has been described to you as a, those individuals' duties should now file a financial disclosure statement. So what language can you recommend to put in this policy that would trigger notification of the board to review these titles based on some sort of changes to our staffing. So like right now I'm seeing that it could come from a number of different places, but it could just as easily not come at all. And so what can we do? Um, like maybe the ethics panel could annually review titles to see if they have recommendations to make sure that all of the titles they want ethic, they want financial disclosure forms on come to the board for review. So if there's changes to staffing and the ethics review panel feels that one of those staffing changes is not in our current list, then they could at, they could notify the policy review committee and ask us to review it. They would notify the board directly, it or seems no, to me. Yeah, yeah. right, so. notify the board directly. But what I'm looking for is someone to routinely monitor that and notify the board if there's a change so that that has something that will definitely trigger it as opposed to might or might not trigger it. So if someone has the authority to review that and bring it to the board's attention, it seems to me that the ethics review panel could review that. So I believe it's policy 2310, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that that is a policy that requires that um, the board approve 
any position, any positional changes, organizational changes at the position of executive director or above. And I'm thinking while I'm speaking, which is always somewhat danger, dangerous members of the committee, but I'm wondering if um, a cross reference, first of all, to 2310, uh, since, and again, I believe that is the correct policy. Ms. Um, Wash, if you wouldn't mind checking that very quickly for me, please. Uh, but it seems to me that a cross reference so that once so that when the approval comes to the the board for the um, for the organi organizational change that there is also a review of those positions that are being recommended um, to in, to determine whether or not they should be covered by the financial disclosure policy okay so how would you put that language in this policy that's just it. I wasn't suggesting that be put in this policy, but let me think for a moment, please, members of the committee. So members of the committee, I do not believe my suggestion would work because there are several titles on this list that would not have to be approved in an organizational change because you only approve at the level of executive director or above. Okay, so that doesn't actually trigger a review. Madam Chair. Go ahead, Ms. Hen. I have a suggestion and would like to withdraw um, my motion and make a new motion, if I may. Does the second? Object? No objection. Go ahead, Ms. Hen. Thank you. I move to amend policy 8364. So, correct number, right? Okay. By deleting periodic and inserting by the superintendent on pertinent organizational changes on page one after as review, so that the policy reads as follows. Any other employees so designated by the board as review by the superintendent on pertinent organizational changes would suggest. Is there a second? Second, Ms. Causey. Okay, is there any discussion on that? Ms. Howie, what's your feedback on that? Does that achieve our goal here? Because I like where Ms. Hunt is going with this. I'm just trying to figure out a way there. Just for the sake of the committee, does the rest of the committee like what we're trying to achieve by this? Does anyone object where we're trying to end up and that we just have to get there with the language? I'm going to assume if you don't say anything that you like where we're going and we just need to get there with the language. Okay, Ms. Howie, so I think they like where we're trying to end up. Okay. We just need to get there with the language. So the question is, we are behind our schedule. Can we get there with the language today or should we bring this back to the next meeting? Do you need time to work on this? If that's the recommended amendment, we can simply incorporate the amendment as this is taken forward to the full board. Will this do what we're trying to do? If what you're trying to do is to establish that the superintendent uh, would review uh, whether or not uh, new positions or positions require um, financial disclosure requirement, then that would do this. Yes, I like that. Ms. Pitts, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. All in favor. The motion carries. Is there any objection to policy 8364 financial disclosure statements moving as amended to the full board for approval with a recommendation from the committee? Ms. Rowe, I had put something in the chat. I'm sorry, go ahead, Ms. Causey. I move policy 8364 be amended on page five, line 20 by replacing quote for 
with quote 10. Would you like, is there a second to that? Could Mrs. Causey read the um, recommended language change? Certainly. The panel or the office designated by the board shall retain financial disclosure statements for four years from the date of receipt is how it's currently worded. Uh, with my amendment, it would then state, this is on page five, line 19. The panel or the office designated by the board shall retain financial disclosure statements for 10 years from the date of receipt. I'll second it for discussion. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Dr. Hager, you had a question. May I speak to my motion? I suppose. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. So there has been a real situation where uh, in 2019, uh, an outside auditor was doing a, a review and the period that was supposed to be encompassed went back seven years. Uh, so, and the legislative, so that uh, it would in the future pre prevent uh, information from being available and um, board members terms have um, increased so they have multiple terms and also the legislative audits go back five to six years so only keeping uh, ethics financial disclosure statements four years um, would not be advisable in my opinion. Okay Dr. Hager you had a question? Um, I get, yeah, I mean, it mostly was answered by Ms. Causey. I, I'm on the fence about this one. Just um, 10 years is a really long time to uh, retain these documents, given that once they are filed, then, then they can be accessed through, um, uh, they're publicly available. Is that, is that correct? The, the financial disclosure form. So just thinking, you know, 10 years is a long time uh, for these things to be retained and to be accessible by the public. Um, but I also see what you're saying, Ms. Causey, with, with your rationale. So I guess I'm, I'm on the fence about this one. So members of the board, you, there is currently uh, a ban on destruction of any documents, just so that the board is aware that nothing is being thrown away. Where nothing is being um, disposed of consistent with the, um, the approved records retention schedule. Okay, Ms. Han, you had another question? Yeah, just a quick one. Are we scanning these and storing them electronically now? No, ma'am. Okay. Are there plans to in the near future? I don't Do you know? believe so. I've not been involved in any discussions concerning uh, making any of these documents available electronically or storage electronically. Okay. That I agree with what Dr. Hager said in terms of the length of time. However, um, there is a need and, and I would be less concerned if we were storing them electronically. I think um, there's no reason to put a time limit um, on electronic file storage. So um, I do see the need and we'll be supporting this motion. Um, given the, the past history of events, both in Baltimore County and elsewhere, um, but I do wish we were storing them electronically because it would address some other concerns I have. So that, thank you, Madam Chair. Ban is still in place, ma'am, and I believe the eMERGE report also addressed um, the fallacy that um, electronic storage is cost free and that there is not still a burden on the system but it is the board's policy. Thank you. Are there any other questions on this motion? Dr. Hager, I see you typing. Do you have something to say? No, I'm good. Okay. Ms. Pitts, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Hassan? No. And Ms. Rowe? Yes. We have three in favor, two opposed. Okay, the motion carries. Are there any other motions for policy 8346 or questions?
Okay, hearing none. Is there any objection to policy 8364, um, financial disclosure statements, uh, proceeding to the full board with a recommendation of the committee? Hearing none, policy 8364 is recommended to the full board. Okay, next, unfinished business. Policy 8350, Council. Ms. Howie, please proceed. Thank you. Members of the committee, you have before you um, proposed changes to 8350, which has been retitled Council. As you're aware, 4104 of the education article previously had uh, four words or three words that applied to, that excluded Baltimore County from the ability to be able to retain counsel. Now that the statute has been changed and that you as a Board of Education are able to retain counsel, this policy has been amended to reflect that change. In addition to recommending changes based on the statute, we've also looked at sister jurisdictions and added other language. For example, uh, that you include in your annual budget sufficient funds to cover council costs. And finally, consistent with your handbook, that your board council be your parliamentarian. And as I said, that is in your handbook. Those are the changes that are being recommended based on your handbook, based on changes in state law. Happy to answer questions. Any members, are there questions? Um, this is Erin. I'm sorry, I'm on my phone, but I do have a question. Go ahead. Um, my only question about this one was that it said there was no fiscal note, um, yet I, even though I know we, we did retain council in the past, um, there was no budget line item for it, so I was just confused by by that, even though I, I know it did happen before, so I guess it's a little bit confusing. Would you like me to respond, um, Ms. Rowe? Go ahead. So uh, changing the policy, uh, which simply indicates that you have the authority to retain counsel, does not impact the budget because what was previously budgeted, uh, initially it was, and for several years, it was uh, managed through this office and then through the board office, doesn't change the ultimate impact that the policy would have. So there is not additional cost in the system because you are including this policy. Ms. Causey, you had a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so um, in terms of specifying, it says the funds for legal services shall be included in the annual budget. But the question is, is who and how is it put there? So is that up to the superintendent to put it in the budget because he presents the entire budget to uh, the board in January? I just thought there should be some um, clarification. Sure, what would you like clarified, ma'am? Maybe I can help. Um, Ms. Howie, when the superintendent presents the budget request to the board, are you presenting the budget request to the board as the secretary treasurer of the board or as the superintendent? I believe the way the statute reads, it's all county superintendents must do that. It's okay. a requirement of the statute. So, but the budget for the Board of Education is the board's budget request, is it not? The so whole the superintendent budget. prepares it. So basically through the budgeting process, that is the board's budget, we as the board can add more money, take money away, et cetera. Correct. So the that's part of the it proposes and the board adopts um, and has the, um, the complete uh, autonomy to uh, recommend changes based on what you believe to be uh, priorities. And the board has done that. Okay. Then it gets sent because because when it's sent over to the county, it's no longer the superintendent's budget. It's the board's. Sure. And so then the so just to clarify, the board 
has the ability to alter the budget the superintendent gives us to potentially include more or less money. And then once it goes to the county executive, the county executive can add or take money away. And then it goes to the county council and the county council can only take money away. Correct. OK, so that's the process. Um, Ms. Hen, you had a question? I did. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, in that vein, though, once we receive the um, appropriation back from the county, the, this, it's back to the superintendent. So in other words, the board has not um, reallocated and cannot reallocate without submitting a BAT back to the county council for approval. So we may need something in this policy um, that secures this this funding regardless of whether it's it's provided by the county because if it is cut then the superintendent needs to provide that in the budget elsewhere so somewhere where he can where it can be allocated and i don't know how to accomplish that in this policy so i am looking for direction so ms howie when the budget comes back from the county council and it's been approved by the county council Hypothetically, if the board feels that there's not enough money in the board's budget for legal fees, does the board have the ability to vote and request that the superintendent reallocate money from other places within the same of the 13 categories to make up with the county executive or the county council cut? I mean, I think we just did that with the whole Tabco thing. So ordering and thankfully Mr. Hartlove is on the line, ordering the superintendent to reallocate. I believe is within the board's authority. My understanding is when the board approves the budget, they're, report, they're approving money within 13 categories and that if money moves within the same category, it does not require a BAT transfer. So it seems to me that if the board wants to move money from someplace else in the same category as the board's legal budget, that we have the authority to do that without county executive and county council approval. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Julie, does that answer your question? It does. And how we go about doing that, what I'm questioning is whether or not the committee wants to put that into this policy rather than a separate directive on an as needed basis and if it would be appropriate to include it in policy. I don't know because that's part of our budget process. We already have the ability to do that. So what would we say in the policy? Just reiterate something we already have the ability to do. Like in other words, we don't need to say it in policy for us to have the right to move money in the budget and the board can even initiate a bat transfer if we want to. So given that the board has a lot of authority over the budget, if the if the county executive or the county council cuts money from our our legal um, line item fund, we can do one of two things. We can move money from within the same category or we can ask for a bat transfer like right then and say and send it back to the county executive and the county council so like that stuff we can already do i'm not sure why we need to articulate it in policy because we're not creating a right it already exists Ms. Howie, do you have any feedback on the subject i guess i'm not sure which problem we're trying to solve we're trying to dissolve that this is not discretionary and that it's to be funded as a priority to the board, which we state through our policies as our part of our vision, that this is a priority to be funded regardless of the final appropriation we receive, that the shall superintendent be, needs to prioritize it in his budget. Shall be included. Shall is directive. And this is the board indicating through its policy making function that you shall include 
monies for your legal fees in your annual budget. Okay, so if the county council or and the county executive cut that money, what's the language in this policy that requires the superintendent to take that money from somewhere else and put it there? As you indicated, Ms. Rowe, the board already has that authority to direct the superintendent. So if we wanted to make that direction standing in policy, what would be the best way to do that? In other words, if we didn't want to wait for a future board or our board or any board to direct that, if we just wanted it to be a standing mechanism, how would do you have a suggestion of how we would do that language in this policy? So I can certainly think about that, but I suppose my question to the board or to the committee to consider is um, why you would prioritize in your policy this funding over any other kind of funding. Because the board having legal counsel and access to legal counsel makes the board fundamentally functional. If you take all the legal counsel away from the board, you undermine the board's ability to do anything because we don't have lawyers on the board necessarily like we did in the past. And so it's necessary that the board have as much legal counsel as the board needs. And so having something that can be manipulated simply by denying funding could effectively obstruct the work of the board simply by denial of funding for legal services. Theoretically. I would have to consider more carefully how you craft that language to the committee satisfaction. I don't believe I'm fully grasping, again, um, what issue you believe has not been addressed in terms of inclusion in the budget and your ability to direct the superintendent to redirect funds. Um, but I'm happy to uh, consider more carefully the sort of language that would be um, uh, acceptable to the committee. Okay, so. Can I make, um, sorry, can I make a comment? This is Aaron. Oh, go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, sorry, my phone is, I, I can't text uh, in. But um, so it sounds to me like the policy has language that says that we need to have a line item in the budget for our legal counsel. Um, and the concern is that it could be stripped down to, to, to an amount that it isn't useful. Um, having said that, I just don't see how we could put put it in policy to ensure that the, the figure, you know, that the bottom line number is sufficient to cover what we end up needing. Um, I feel like the, the fact that it, it, the policy is requiring that we do have funding for council to me is sufficient. And, you know, there's some level of trust that there will be enough funding to cover what we need. And if not, then we do have other budgetary ways that we can make sure that the amount is secured. So I don't know, I feel like they, I think that's how I said it earlier. I'm not sure what the problem is, but I, I think we can, I think we can, I think what's in there now to me is sufficient to ensure that we do have some budget line to cover our legal fees. Okay, Ms. Han, you have a motion? I do, and I had a comment before my motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, before the statute changed to give us the ability to hire our own counsel, um, it stated that Baltimore County provided counsel for the board, which essentially put them on the hook to um, fund that council, even though that was not the case for the past several years, as Ms. Howie um, gave us the history of that. It, um, it secured that in a way such that the board would always have counsel. Um, that is what this motion tries to accomplish the same, is a guarantee that the board can still um, operate with counsel because as Ms. Rowe um, so eloquently stated, we we can't and it would bring the school system to a halt should we not have counsel available to us. Um, that being said, I move to amend policy 8350 by inserting if the board's annual appropriation does not include funding for legal services, the superintendent shall reallocate available funding for such services. Second, Ms. Causey. So, um, Ms. Hen, I can't imagine a budget that wouldn't include any funding for legal services. I think that the, your wording should be changed such that it reads 
if the board's annual appropriation does not include the requested funding for legal services, the superintendent shall reallocate available funding for such services. So in other words, if what the board requests in the original budget submission is not allocated, then it has to be made up by the superintendent. Ms. Rowe, I, I, I would amend that. Ms. Hen, before you do that, may I may I please make a comment? I've been sure. in yes. the chat. OK, we. This is an important issue because it has happened in recent past that there was not sufficient funds uh, provided for the board um, in, in more than one case in the legal case, but also in other funding. So I think it is important to spell out that um, the funds for legal services um, will be like the other budgets recommended by the superintendent for approval by the board because it did slip through uh, with, um, I guess, transition of staff to uh, not include sufficient funding for some board items. And then unbeknownst to the board, there's uh, graphs that show percentage over. And then the next thing you know, there's an official report on it. So yes, it needs to be clarified. And I think Ms. Hen's motion as it stands um, does it. And the only other thing I would say is to add the word sufficient somewhere because uh, for instance, this new board coming on, they don't have the history of how much uh expenditures there has been for legal fees or conference fees or uh any of those other things so it shouldn't be upon uh the board when you know the reporting and so forth goes through the superintendent staff like our chief financial officer mr hartlove thank you very much uh and the other staff okay so how do we want to change this language do we want to say appropriation um, do we want to say if the board's annual appropriation does not include sufficient funding for legal services, the superintendent shall reallocate available funding for such services? I like that, Ms. Rowe. I, I like that too. Ms. Causey? I would need to hear it again. And I'm I think putting, the, I'm the putting it in the chat. Yeah, if the board's annual appropriation does not include sufficient funding for legal services, the superintendent shall reallocate available funding for such services. I think that's pretty clear. Basically what it means is whatever legal services the board needs will be paid for. Perfect. Is there any objection to this amendment? Um, I have a comment. This is Aaron Hager. Go ahead, Dr. Hager. Um, I Again, I worry that the word sufficient, I, I know we can't specify a number, which was my concern from the outset, um, but the word sufficient is also very vague. And I worry that we're, we're saying that this gets priority over other things in the school system without a dollar figure. So what, what's sufficient to one person may not be the same to another person. And knowing that this money could get reallocated from something else um, just concerns me a little bit. So I think my definition of sufficient and maybe we need to include this definition in the policy. I don't know. I'll let um, Ms. Howie comment on that. But the definition of sufficient in my mind is if the board votes and the board approves to retain legal services and pay legal services a specific amount of money, then the legal debt incurred by the board is itself sufficient, meaning Whatever amount of money the board spends on legal services, the superintendent needs to move to that line item. Because the board will be approving this as the board goes along. The board will know how much we're spending and what the original allocation was. The superintendent will participate in those conversations. So sufficient is whatever the board decides to spend as a whole board. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Would adding the word received, and I put this in the chat, um, address your comment? 
OK, so if the board's annual appropriation does not include sufficient funding for legal services received, the superintendent shall reallocate available funding for such service. Yes, I think that's better language with that word. Does anyone object to that language? The language is if the board's annual appropriation does not include sufficient funding for legal services received, the superintendent shall reallocate available funding for such services. Ms. Rowe, this is Ms. Causey. Yes, go ahead. Um, it is in policy and regulation that expenditures will not be made uh, if there is not budget allocated for it. So it shouldn't be that services are received and then we uh, secure the funding. And Ms. Howie, if you want to correct or confirm that for me, for us. We do that all the time. And then we call it a bat transfer at the end of the year. All the time departments spend money that's not in their allocation. And then at the end of the year, we request a bat transfer to make them whole. This is no different. So, Ms. Rowe, if, if, if I could um, just say that Public Works uh, said that they that we should not do that process, that we should have three bats a year so that we are in a more timely fashion addressing the expenditures with the funding. But I would like to uh, have Ms. Howie comment if, if you would facilitate that. Go ahead, Ms. Howie. And what is your specific question, ma'am? Ms. Causey? That in policy and regulation for uh, procurement expenditures, that um, services should not be received unless they have funding already allocated. Is that correct? Services should not be contracted unless there is sufficient funding for those services. And services should be received, should, should be paid for only after they're received. I believe that was one of the OLA's findings, that there was a concern in 2019 about whether or not services had actually been received. Um, so I don't know if that responds to your question, but in terms of billables for attorneys, um, as Ms. Hen's aware, as you're aware, given the um, the fact that the the board members uh, or board officers review uh, bills, that um, you as stewards of the county fisc uh, ensure that not everyone calls uh, board council uh, in order to control or contain costs. Um, that is something that uh, you've done as a matter of process and procedure. Uh, so you're you're seeing on a regular basis exactly what you're spending. And if you anticipate that there is going to be a spike in spending uh, because of you know fill in the blank issue, that uh, there would be planning at that point to ensure that there is sufficient money to pay for those services, those additional services. Okay, Ms. Hen has put in the chat different suggested language. That is, if the board's annual appropriation does not include sufficient funding for anticipated legal services required, the superintendent shall reallocate available funding for such services. So I guess my issue with that is, I'm not entirely certain that we can always anticipate the need for legal services. We don't know who's going to sue us at any given point. We don't know how many people are going to file appeals and we're going to have to pay hearing examiners and our board attorney to do those appeals. So the ability to even anticipate what legal services we're going to require is usually something triggered by events outside our control. For me personally, I think I like the previous iteration of the language better. Committee members? Ms. Rowe? Yes, I agree, and I I would omit anticipated. I okay, I, so we're back I to hear Ms. funding. I do. I hear Miss Causey's point about um, making the adjustments after the fact, but as and as you said, it's it's SOP, right? With with the end of year um, yeah reallocation, this language 
I believe addresses both of your concerns. OK, so we're back to the previous iteration as a suggestion then. If it's the board, similar to the previous iteration. OK, if like the board's annual appropriation does not include sufficient funding for legal services required, the superintendent shall reallocate available funding for such services. Yeah, I'm OK with that. Committee members, does anyone object to this language? Can we vote on it? We'll vote on it, OK. Ms. Pitts, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Ms. Causey. I'm not sure there was a second, so I'll second it first. If okay, that's you, Ms. Causey. Okay, and then I'll vote yes. Thank you. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Ms. Hassan? Uh, Ms. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Four in favor, one against. Okay, the motion carries. Are there any more uh, motions or questions regarding policy 8350? Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. Go ahead. Um, I move to amend policy 8350 line 10 to add the language as provided by state law. Could you read the full language of what that will read with that language Cer added? Certainly. On page one, starting at line seven, the Board of Education of Baltimore County is authorized and empowered to retain the services of an attorney to represent it in legal matters affecting the board as provided by state law. Is there a second? I'll second that. Is there any discussion regarding this amendment? I would just like to say it, it then clarifies state law, which is a new clarification this year, but also it's uh, consistent with other districts in the policies uh, that were included in the policy analysis. So thank you to staff for uh, including that in policy analysis. Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, there is a legal reference as consistent with our other policies to that state law. So I would not support this only because of consistency with our other policies that it is listed there. So editing conventions? Editing conventions and I, I don't see the need to add it there, but I appreciate Mrs. Causey's intent for her motion. Are there any other comments? Ms. Rowe, I, I just would point out that it it uh, was a matter of, of uh, quite some uh, concern and, and commentary, and it is brand new, so I think it is worth noting. Okay. Ms. Pitts, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Hen? No. Ms. Hassan? No. Ms. Rowe? No. One in favor, four opposed. All right, the motion does not carry. Are there any other uh, comments or questions or motions for policy 8350? And we are well behind time, committee members. Okay, hearing none. Does anyone object to policy 8350 council proceeding to the full board with a recommendation by the committee as amended? Hearing none, policy 8350 is recommended to the full board as amended. Thank you, members of the committee. Um, members of the committee, you, you do sorry. have uh, new policies or new business being brought to you from um, uh, fiscal services uh, for Mr. Hartlove and Mr. Fannin. I'm not sure if you have sufficient time um, to hear all of these policies. It's surely the committee's pleasure at this point. So Ms. Howie, that's what I was going to ask the committee is, um, does the committee, do the committee members have the ability to stay until 630 so that we can continue this? Yes. Yes. I can as well. I can as uh, well. This is Mr. Fong. 
OK, so that's everyone. OK, so we will continue this meeting until 630. Um, Ms. Howie, I'm going to defer to you as to if you'd like to change the order of items on the agenda to best fit that time. I think if we do this till 630, we'll have time. Um, do you think that's the case? So if you proceed to 630, um, it's possible to um, have sufficient time to discuss the 3000 series policies. You will not have sufficient time to discuss 5550 and 5560. OK, and let's sure. proceed with the 3000 series since we have staff present to present that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hartlove and Mr. Fannin, uh, we turn it over to you. Thank you, committee members. We are presenting policies 3000, 3126 and 3127 for review in accordance with board policy 8130. Uh, these three are part of our policies to ensure we provide fiscal responsibility and accountability. Uh, the first uh, board policy 3000 establishes the responsibility for accountability of all funds received by BCPS and maximum effectiveness and efficiency in all fiscal processes and procedures. The edits clarify changes in accordance with uh, editing conventions. We inserted uh, the BCPS acronym. Uh, we added the word school prior to system for clarity. Uh, we uh, compared the policy to multiple other school system policies and policy 3000 is consistent with those other systems and we looked at nine other school systems. Do you want me to stop there and go through the others or? Let's do them one policy at a time. Committee members, are there questions on policy 3000 non instructional services? Yes, Madam Chair. Go ahead, yes, Ms. Causey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hartlove, for you and your team's work on this. Um, in the draft policy, um, it doesn't have line numbers on the version that I have. Uh, but anyway, it's paragraph A. And it says the Board of Education of Baltimore County recognizes that the effective and efficient use of its resources is essential to ensure that Baltimore County Public Schools, BCPS, remains a model of public sector fiscal management. Uh, and I think that it needs to be made clear uh, that uh, the board is uh, talking about the entire school system that is under its purview and that Baltimore County Public Schools is essentially uh, the um, popular name, the the branding name for um, the school system, Baltimore County Public Schools, Team BCPS, if you will. So uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, just to make a inclusion to ensure that uh, the school system, uh, also known as Baltimore County Public Schools, remains a model of public sector fiscal management. And I'm, I'll, I'll listen to my colleagues with their opinions. Committee members. OK, hearing no other comments or questions. Is there any objection to moving policy 3000 non instructional services to, to the full board with a recommendation by the committee? Hearing no objection, policy 3000 is recommended to the full board. Policy 3126, expense and travel. Uh, Mr. Fannin. Um, I can go forward. This is Mr. Hartlove. Oh, I'm um, sorry. I've got it, my names mixed up. Sorry, sir. That is OK. You can confuse me with Pat any day. He's a good guy. Uh, um, this policy. Uh, po uh, board policy 3126 expense and travel reimbursement um, establishes the that board members and employees may be reimbursed for travel expenses for official business. Um, the, uh, we compared the policy to multiple other school system policies and policy 3126 is consistent with those other systems. Um, we did uh, we did insert the new section implementing rule with a hyperlink uh, as recommended by uh, Public Works. Committee members, are there any questions on policy 3126? Ms. Causey? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Actually, my question had been on policy 3000, but um, 
uh, we moved right along. Um, again, I would just uh, point out the language of BCPS um, as uh, the policy would indicate that it's a separate entity, but in fact, there is no legal entity uh, other than the Board of Education of Baltimore County. Um, and what had been typical in past policies is to speak to the school system, school system officials, school system employees. Uh, so I think that that should be clarified because um, it 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 um, it's important. Miss Holly, can you speak to that? What is the official name of the school system for the purposes of what Ms. Causey's referencing? So the Board of Education of Baltimore County is the entity that can sue or be sued. It's a person under law. The school system, also called the local education agency, is not considered to be a legal entity that can sue or be sued. It is the, um, the organization that is directed by the Board of Education. There are some definitions, both in regulation and in statute, that define school system as the board. Um, and the so if you think about the board as the board of directors, and the board of directors, part of the board of directors are the schools that um, are subject to the board. Um, part of the board of directors are the is the administration. But Ms. Causey is accurate in that the school system, and um, as staff members know, school district uh, to, to me is like um, uh, nails on a chalkboard because there's no such thing in the state of Maryland. But in any case, the school system is the entity that that is um, directed, uh, directed by the superintendent through the Board of Education. So, OK, so. That's confusing. Um, <laughs> then I did so, my job. So for standing in court, we have a corporate entity, a legal entity called the Baltimore County Board of Education. Mm -hmm. But when we refer to the school system, we're referring to it as the local education agency. That is correct. And that definition of local education agency is what, like a governmental entity? It is considered to be the administration and the schools that are part of the administration as well. OK, and just for clarity, the title Team BCPS is a marketing logo. I don't know if I call it marketing. It is what we call the system. I see. OK, so for the purposes of what McSauzy is talking about in this policy, what's the appropriate language? The school system as an LEA? or the Board of Education of Baltimore County? Well, first of all, it's the board. It's the board's policy. So you tell the system how you want this, what you what the goals are that the board has for the system to follow. OK. Ms. Ham, you have a question? Yes, thanks, Ms. Rowe. Along that same vein, then, how do we differentiate when in policy when we are referring to the board, 12 member board versus the board being the legal entity that can sue and be sued? So it depends on the policy. My favorite answer, it depends. Uh, in the 8000 series, for example, the board could be either, but usually it is the 12 member board because you are discussing and determining uh, your internal operations. So the right. board is determining how it's going to hold meetings. It's determining how it's going to hold elections. Those are all internal to the 12 people um, who direct and who oversee the superintendent to oversee the school system. Thank you. And the context usually makes that clear, as you said um, in your explanation, which was very helpful. Um, depend depending on what that that context is and what that policy is for future thought or you know we can stick a pin in this for the pot the committee to come back to I think it would be helpful um, if there was a standard convention when we are referring to the 12 members versus the legal entity 
whether it I don't know what that may look like, but I'm open to any staff recommendations on how we can make crystal clear which it is we are referring to so that one, we don't have to have this discussion again, but also more importantly for our our public to know um, and to be able to differentiate between the two when they're reading it so that it is clear. So perhaps it could be something in editing conventions, a recommendation for yes. editing conventions, Ms. Howie. And, sure. and 3126 is gave me that idea because I think it's a good example when we're referring to members of the board versus board employees. That might be the convention right there when we're referring to it. That might not fit every um, circumstance, but it certainly is very clear in this case um, which we are referring to. OK, so if Ms. Howie, if you could work on a recommendation to change the editing conventions sure. separate from this policy. Are there any more questions about policy 3126? Well, yes, I think we should change that language. Uh, well, if we change our editing conventions, the language of all our policies will be changed to comply. Well, this one's up for a review right now. Approved expenses incurred by members of the Board of Education of Baltimore County and board employees in the course of conducting official business of the board or the school system, also known as Baltimore County Public Schools, shall be reimbursed in accordance with the rules and procedures established by the superintendent. I don't actually have a problem with that language the way it reads now. I can understand why it might be confusing, but given Ms. Howard's explanation, it's no longer confusing. But I do think differentiating etiquette conventions and definitions might be. I think you've lost me. This entire conversation, like I'm just not following. Can we pass this policy and deal with editing conventions later, or do we need to hold this policy until the editing conventions are done? Committee members, is there an opinion? Ms. Let's Hopper? pass it and move on. Yes, I think staff could bring the recommendation when it comes to the full board. The editing conventions are yours. They belong to PRC. What I can do is send the editing <laughs> conventions to uh, or resend them to the committee so that you have them to refer um, to more specifically. But this does specify board employee, which would not be board member, and board of education, um, which would not be school system because the two entities um, are described separately in this policy. I agree that we can move this policy forward and deal with the editing conventions at a separate time. Ms. Pitts, would you call the roll, please? Well, wait, do we even have a motion on the floor? We do not. No, there's no amendments for this. So is there any objection to moving 3126 to the full board for approval? Um, I would object, but Ms. Pitts, would you call the roll on moving policy 3126 to the full board for approval? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Four in favor, one opposed. Okay. Um, the motion carries. Policy 3126 is recommended to the full board for approval. Policy 3127 travel approval. Mr. Hartloff. Um, sure. Uh, travel. This policy establishes the requirement for prior approval for overnight travel, which is in accordance with the goal of fiscal responsibility and accountability. Um, it clarifies the prior approval requirement and deletes unnecessary words. Um, it also, uh, similar to uh, Board Policy 3126, it uh, adds the new section implementing rule, 
uh, with the hyperlink to uh, as recommended by uh, Public Works. Committee members. Are there any questions, comments, amendments to policy 3127? I have one, Ms. Rowe. Go ahead, Ms. Hen. Thank you. I have a motion and I'd like to put it in the chat, if I may. Sure. Thank you. I'm open to language adjustments on this. Um, I move to amend policy 3127 by inserting students and before the school system on line 12 so that the policy reads, the board acknowledges that the priority of all employees is to further the vision, mission, and goals of BCPS and the decisions regarding travel should be based on the needs of students and the school system. Is there a second? I'll second that. Ms. Hunt, would you like to speak to your motion, please? Sure. I think we need to put students front and center um, wherever possible in our policies, and this is an opportunity to do so. Um, we need to align our, our resources, um, fiscally certainly, um, to our students, and that these decisions, when being made, we need to consider um, Again, every dollar, how those dollars are being spent and how they are going to benefit our students first and foremost and consider them when making these decisions. So this was an opportunity I saw to do so by modifying this policy. OK, Ms. Cause, you have a question. Go ahead. Thank you for that. Um, I'm sorry, was, was there a second? Yes, I seconded it. OK, thank you. Um, I would uh, suggest changing BCPS on line 16 to official uh, either board and school system or school system business. Mr. Rowe, is that a second motion? We have a motion on the floor. Well, yeah, that is a second motion. Thank so, you. Ms. Causey, okay. if you'll hold that and you can make sure. that motion after we process this one. May I make a follow up comment regarding my Go motion? Ahead, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, I also feel that these decisions um, also need to consider students and the, their instruction um, when we're talking about employees being away, um, particularly teachers who may be away from, from teaching, especially given our staffing needs and that we are considering students' needs first and foremost. Um, so not only what is the value of the travel to our students, but also what is the cost of individuals being away from the system and how will that impact the students in their absence? Thank you. Ms. Hunt, I couldn't agree more. Um, are there any committee members who have any comments or further discussion on Ms. Hen's motion to amend policy 3127 by inserting students and be I, I students and me. before the school system. Uh, this is Karen Hager, I have a comment. Go ahead, Dr. Hager. Um, I just wanted, I was trying to think of practically how this would play out. Um, so most of, most overnight travel that I'm aware of would either be a professional development opportunity or um, an opportunity to highlight some of the work that's happening in BCPS. Um, for example, I was in a meeting today where they were talking about a, a health and physical education conference um, this year and next year and, and appropriately budgeting so that staff were, would have those opportunities for professional development. This is a conference that's always on the weekends. So then most um, local conferences like that are on weekends that, that, that they do often require overnight travel. So I guess it would just require some sort of justification for how the professional development opportunity would link to a student or um, I, I don't know I just 
I'm hard pressed to figure out uh, an opportunity that wouldn't better a teacher or staff member so that they would be better at their job. Um, I, but was there an expectation that some sort of form be filled out to translate that experience to the students or, or kind of what, what is the expectation here? Ms. Hedges, Ms. would you like to speak yes. to that? Thank you, Ms. Rowe, yes. Um, so the goal here is really mindfulness to consider the impact on students, both positive and potentially adverse. Um, what is the plan for um, students in the absence if it is um, the teacher of record or someone um, whose absence will affect students? Um, well, there's very, you know, there's a positive benefit as well when they're completing a form for anticipated travel. It's just to consider the impact to students and when making these arrangements, again, both as a justification as well as, oh, let me think about what my plan might be when I'm I'm going to be traveling overnight if that's um, pertinent to it. So to, just to put students at the forefront of our decision making um, on, on both sides of the coin, that's all. So, so just to follow up, I, I and I'm on my phone, so I can't see the. the no, go ahead, language, Dr. Hager. I, and I can read it, it the full thing if you'd like. No, no, that that's fine. Like. I, I, I heard it the first time, but but to me it didn't sound like. So it sounds like the maybe the bigger concern is the impact of absence of teachers and staff on students because of overnight travel. So is is that really the point of the the amendment? It's it's both. It's um, what are the needs of students? How is the travel and the cost of the travel going to add value to the st to students? Um, meaning there's an opportunity cost, right, of the the money spent on the overnight travel, but also what are the plans for instruction in that individual's absence if students are affected by it? So the um, the the phrase, and I'll keep this brief, it says, and the decisions regarding travel should be based on the needs of students and the school system. So my motion adds students um, along with the school system so that we're considering the impact both positive and adverse on students. Committee members, are there any other discussions on Ms. Hem's motion? Ms. Pitts, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Dr. Hager. Um, yes. Thank you. Ms. Hen. Yes. Ms. Hassan. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. The motion carries. Are there any other motions or discussion for policy 3127? I think Ms. Causey, you had one. Yes, Ms. Rowe. Thank you. I move to amend policy 3127 by replacing on line 11 the word BCPS with board for the school system and line 16 replace BCPS with board and school system. Second. Um, is there any discussion on this motion? Just speaking to my motion, I think it again clarifies the um, the entity and the um and the the flow of the vision mission and goals of the board and the school system for the students so i i really um like miss hens and i voted for it of course but i really like just putting that right in the center with the students needs okay is there any more discussion on miss causey's motion one quick question i i like that it i like that it aligns um these two sections with the board's um, mission and our commitment. It is board policy, and I think that the BCPS goals are defined in the superintendent's rules. So um, I'm supporting it because I like how it's aligned with the beginning of the policy statement. Any other discussion on the motion? Hearing none, Ms. Pitts, would you please call the roll? Ms. Causey? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes, the motion carries. Are there any other motions or discussions on policy 3127? Hearing none, is there any objection to policy 3127 prep travel approval? 
moving to the full board with the recommendation of the committee as amended. Hearing no objection, policy 3127 travel approval is recommended to the full board. Okay, so we are not doing item five because Ms. Howie is not here and we removed that. So item six, announcements and adjournment. The next meeting of the policy review committee is scheduled for Monday, November 14th, 4.30 p.m. Because there's no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you everyone for attending and thank you staff for staying late.